Last time we looked at the Slipstream Drive and how it could be the future for Starfleet propulsion technology, but then an interesting comment popped up asking about the coaxial warp drive that also appeared in Voyager, specifically in the episode vis a -vis, where a prototype vessel emerges testing this technology and shenanigans ensue. The interesting thing is that unlike Slipstream, which was deigned too dangerous without further tuning of the technology, transwarp coils, which were used but not understood enough to replicate, or the infamous Warp 10 from the Cochrane shuttle test that caused a hyper-evolution, the coaxial induction drive was fitted to a shuttlecraft then used successfully with no real disadvantages. Those weaknesses that were there were also fixed by Tom Paris and implemented in a Class 2 shuttlecraft, which was almost able to perform a stable coaxial warp jump. First off, let's look at how it's presented in the show. A small starship plops into existence near the USS Voyager along ripples and folds in the space around it, while the ship's drive itself is on the edge of detonating. The crew manage to stabilise these spatial folds and the core by extending a symmetric warp field around the vessel to dissipate the drive's effect and save the ship. From there, they learned that particle instabilities in the drive kept on cropping up that were causing the drive to malfunction and threaten explosions. Paris tests the notion of implementing a polaric modulator to dilute the particle stream like a carburetor would do to fuel. This appeared to provide far more stability to the jumps that before this were reputed to be a rather violent affair. Not only that, but after the vessel had departed, the technology was recreated on a Class II Starfleet shuttlecraft. So how does coaxial warp vary from standard warp speeds? Well, it appears that although both methods of travel warp space-time to get around the whole no going faster than light physics thing that is super annoying, standard warp creates a bubble around the vessel that compresses space in front of the ship and extends it behind, making a sort of self-propelled wave of space-time that the vessel rides. Interestingly, this is represented on screen by that stretching effect that the starships go through when they jump. Coaxial warp, however, is more akin to picking a point of space ahead of you and bending it to your location, then hopping over. This makes for a near instantaneous jump and a different approach to interstellar travel, despite both methods warping space. So the coaxial in this methodology likely refers to the marriage of the two separate points of space for a time, showing the same geometry, cohabiting the same axis. So why wasn't this continued after the episode? The real answer is of course, as usual, dull. Because plot demand we forget about it. But let's look for an in-universe justification for it because that's what I do and that's how I spend my weekends. For a start, I've seen arguments that the drive was deemed too risky due to its potential explosiveness, but that was pretty much resolved before the episode's end, and failing that, they had a workaround to collapse the coaxial field if needed. Then we have the idea that it was technically the imposter Tom Paris that created the drive, implying that the real Paris never actually recreated it. But again, by the end of the episode, Paris is back in his own body and he did have plenty of time to tinker with the original drive, even repairing it. And they recover the shuttle that had the imposter's modifications, so saying they still couldn't figure it out seems ridiculous, especially as one of the first things mentioned is that Starfleet has been toying with the idea for some time now since at least 2368. They knew the theory behind it. So perhaps it's due to the scale of the object that is to be folded into coaxial warp. Both the test ship and the Class 2 shuttle are only rather small, with the shuttle being around 8.5 metres long, and the Bentham test ship larger but still dwarfed by the intrepid Class USS Voyager, which was 345 metres long. It could be the bigger the object, the more energy required, 
more than the drive could produce. Another factor is how efficient it is. The jumps that were seen in the show are never given direct measurements of distance, but the imposter pilot, Steth, says that the ship's point of origin was Benthos, around 20 light years away. The presumption is that coaxial warp is near instantaneous. It is, however, unknown if this distance was traversed in multiple jumps or a single jump, but Steth's familiarity with the drive problem suggests that the vessel has made several flights before. On average, from what has been seen on screens, a Warp 9 flight of 5 days would cover around 20 light years, and a Warp 9.5 would half that, though these are fan calculated values based on what's mentioned on screen and can vary with the script. So it could be that coaxial warp simply isn't worth the effort to develop on a larger scale if the gain is only a fraction faster than conventional warp speeds. Plus, we don't know if there is an extended cooldown or recalculation period for the drive. We also don't know if it required some sort of exotic fuel source that the Voyager only had a limited store of, but there's nothing on screen to suggest this one, so that's just a wild guess. All in all, we don't get a concrete reason why it was never developed again, and we are left to assume that it remains another Delta Quadrant oddity acquired by the USS Voyager and examined by Starfleet on its return to Federation space. We are just left to assume that it didn't work out because otherwise the series would have been over far quicker. Plus, complicating matters further is the source of all of this information an unreliable sociopath that steals identities. In short, this method of travel may not be as effective or stable as conventional warp, and a series of short coaxial jumps performed at an optimal capacity might only be marginally faster than a constant flight of high warp. Who knows, but this is my head cannon for why it was never revisited in the time of the show. What do you think? spot anything else that could explain why Coaxial Warp was never revisited? I'm not sure we'll ever get an answer, but I guess thanks for watching this video anyway on what is known. Until the next one, I've been Rick, and I'll see you later. Goodbye.